So I would just like, there are a bunch of people in the room here today, which is great to see because this is one of our early in-person meetings. So thank you all for coming and supporting our program. It's wonderful to see you all. Um, my name is Arlie Montavo. I'm the chapter president of the Riverside San Bernardino chapter of the California Native Plant Society. I would just like to welcome everybody that's on Zoom and in the um, at the Riverside Corona Resource Conservation District conference room for today's program. We have programs on the third Saturday mornings of the month, generally you know, through the fall until summer, and then we kind of go off calendar for the summer and just have field trips. We've redone, reinitiated our field trip program, so we have field trips scheduled every month, sometimes two. Um, you'll be able to see some of these, um, the, the ones scheduled through the end of May. If you go onto our website, RiversideSanBernardinoCMPS.org, on the field trips tab. Um, and we'll be posting the flyers with the details bit by bit. But so right now there's a flyer for the next field trip. So go on and take a look, it's gonna be great. Uh, CMPS, the California Native Plant Society is an organization of nearly 12,000 members now. We have been growing very well within the last few years. CMPS is doing a lot to conserve native plants and habitats throughout the state of California. And there are, very, there are 26 chapters. Um, it's a remarkable organization. If you're not a member, please do consider joining. You can go to the cmps.org website and there is a page there where you can actually join. And then you can choose us as your main chapter, Riverside San Bernardino chapter. Um, to be a voting member of this chapter, you need to have it as your primary chapter. You can also have a secondary chapter named. So if you wanted to have Orange County or San Diego or Santa Barbara, you know, some other chapter, you can do that. You can have a secondary chapter as well. So we conserve habitats throughout the state from the redwoods all the way to the deserts and coastal areas in, in Southern California. So, um, and we have field trips to lots of remarkable places. So, and sometimes we keep our places sort of secret to the general public. We, we don't always post our information to the wildflower hotline because we don't want some of our special, very sensitive areas overrun by people from everywhere. Because <laughs> we've seen what's happened you know, in some of our amazing wildflower displays um, near Lake Elsinore. So today's program, we have two really great programs today. The first program is being shared, it's a hybrid program, it's being shared by Zoom. So, so those of you who are there remotely can see this until 11 or possibly just after 11 a.m. And then the second, and that will be the program by Ernesto Alvarado on designing gardens with native plants. And I'll tell you a little bit about Ernesto in a minute. And then that will be followed by a break and where you can use the restroom, have some coffee, have some cookies. And then we'll have a little presentation by Barbara Iyer, the author of the Wildflowers of the Inland Empire book. It's a tremendous local wildflower book. She'll tell us about the book and um, give us some information um, about how to identify some of our local wildflowers, which is really cool. And she's be, she'll be selling books and signing books. So those of you who are here remotely, sorry, you won't be able to see this, but um, you can always come, <laughs> you know, leave and come here quickly if you're nearby. So um, without further ado, I'd like to talk a little bit about Ernesto Alvarado. Um, I met Ernesto how many years ago now? <laughs> when he came, he, he applied for a job to work at the Riverside Corona Research Conservation District when I was employed here. I retired three years ago. And I have never been happier with an employee, you know, somebody that I was training and he's just remarkable. He's artistic. He has the most tremendous green thumb I have ever seen. And he has really turned around our, the, the native plant nursery here at the RCD to something just incredible. And, and um, he's supplying plants to 
all the restoration projects for that the RCRCD is doing. It's a very clean nursery following protocols to, to, to keep plants from being infested with Phytophthora water molds. And, and just, it's just remarkable. So hopefully we can have him give a tour of the nursery someday, which would be great. And our habitat area. He also takes care of the habitat area. He became interested in native plants, um, in, native, in growing native plants right out of high school when he was working at a local conservancy um, to help grow plants for restoration projects. And then he went off to college. He went to Humboldt State University, now, now Polytechnic College, um, Humboldt Polytechnic. And he got a degree in wildlife management. He has these, these real paired in, you know, um, interests in native plants and wildlife. And so his gardens are very wildlife friendly and pollinator friendly gardens. So today he is going to present to you some ways to develop your own native plant garden, to think about design concepts. He's doing this as an artist. He's had training in, in landscape architecture and design. Um, and he comes at this from just a, an amazing point of view. It's going to be very different from any native plant garden design program you've seen. And I think you're going to really like it. So welcome. I'd like to bring Ernesto up. <laughs> I've just made him really nervous. <laughs> okay. Um, let me just share the screen here. <laughs> Good, I'm assuming over yeah. there, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, I'm new at public speaking, so please bear with me if I start rushing um, or if I mumble a lot, just if you want clarification, just let me know and I'll slow down. I do, however, have a passion for growing native plants um, and designing native gardens. So I find it difficult to help people one-on-one -on -one to design their gardens, so I figured maybe giving this presentation, I can help them this way. Um, well, I need to use the mouse, okay. <laughs> there we go. So um, the topics we're gonna cover, we're gonna um, see why, why choose California native plants, then we're gonna jump into a quick introduction with a tiny garden and go over some materials that you'll need for your garden design. Then we'll go step-by-step step on how to get started and then uh, go through plant selections through between those steps. So why native plants? So well, native plants are the foundation of native ecosystems and the basis upon which your life depends. They lose uh, less water, they require less maintenance, they bring nature right outside your home and they create habitat. Even the smallest urban garden can provide valuable habitat for pollinators and wildlife. So with that, I want to take you back in time, like 13 years ago, when I used to live in Long Beach. And I used to live in this apartment complex here and down right in this corner here, um, right in, beneath the stairs to go to the second floor. Yeah, I don't know. It's so concrete there. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to zoom into this area here, but through like drawing. Let's, uh, let's go. Uh, yeah, so at this time, I only grown native plants in uh, nursery settings, but never in, in, planting, in planting in restoration sites, but never really in an urban setting. So this was my first one. Um, it was a really small area. Um, there was this uh, concrete path here underneath the stairs and it kind of made it feel like a little nook. So I wanted to have a sitting area there. And then the planting area was about four feet wide and 12 feet long. Um, I wanted some type of coverage here to give me some privacy. And, but I wanted to keep it kind of open too, not too dense. And then, um, on the rest of the garden, I wanted to plant some low growing plants and have a water feature. 
So hold on, did I? Yeah, so some conditions that I noticed was that um, it was heavy, it had heavy soil, clay soil, and it was really soggy because um, the whole courtyard was um, in the same um, schedule. So there was lawn, so they were watering a lot. Um, and in the planter, there had two um, magnolia shrubs that were infested with um, scale. So I asked if I could remove them and plant my own garden here, and they say that I was okay. it was okay to do so. <clears throat> so how I fixed the problem, I just turned the manually the, em the emitters, the sprayers, the spray heads, I turned them off manually. And I hand water whenever you need to. So that's how I resolve that problem. Um, this area I got uh, received the morning shade and then sun in the afternoon and the, uh, the sun also reflected from the window there. All right, so this is how I came up with the little design. Um, I took the middle of the uh, window and I placed my little um, water feature and it was pretty much a glazed pot that I sealed the inside and then I used that as a little um, fountain. Uh, so yeah, so that's where I placed my water feature and I wanted to cover the whole plot with um, something low growing so I used um, the common lipia, phylanoriflora, and that's a really short um, ground cover and it takes pretty, it grows pretty quick in the warm season. So that, that was the first thing that went in, into the soil. It was just pretty much cuttings that I just stuck in the soil and they love the wet, you know, clay soil. And then um, to frame the water feature, I used some Angelita daisies to go with the blue to, um, that's a good, um, what is it called? <laughs> Um, you know, the blue and the yellow, they go perfect. Complimentary, <laughs> Complimentary. thank you. <laughs> okay, so, and for the um, the privacy hedge, I, I used a current and that is pretty open and you can manage the, how it grows. So you can train it to look however you want. So it didn't really cover so much and I could still see through it. And then if, and then on the corner on the other planter, I planted three little um, heucaras or coral bells. And if you're like me, um, I like to I also have um, plants in pots. So I had uh, quite a few pots all over, um, right outside my door, um, including some monkey flowers, some um, California fuchsia, uh, cyanotes on, that I was training to be like a little bonsai, and some um, can canyon dahlias in, on, the, on the table. So if you don't have a big space, um, native plants do well in pots. Um, you can use small perennials, uh, dahlias, um, and senior ground covers and other um, shrubs that, are, you know, their ground covers and native grasses. Yeah, so why do you wanna design your own garden? Well, it's very rewarding. Um, it connects you to your space and to nature. You get to know your garden better and the plants and wildlife that visit. You will feel the sense of achievement. So now before you even get started, um, you want to maybe go on a hike or visit, uh, oops, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or visit like gardens that have native plants um, to get inspiration and ideas and start thinking about uh, what story you want to tell with your garden, whether it's a, a desert landscape or you know a walk through the aromatic coast of sage scrub or even enjoying the shelter of the oak woodland. If you want to bring those elements to your garden, you can do that with native plants. Okay, so lately I've been visiting um, places with a bunch of bulbs and corms, and that's really what inspired me to do. To, I want to bring this to my yard. So um, I'm going to be focusing my design in, 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 on this. So I want to have a meadow with all kinds of bulbs. That's going to be the main focus. So now uh, let's look at the materials. There are two ways of creating a garden design on a computer or by hand on paper. Um, for this presentation, uh, we will be working on paper. Things you need for this are tracing paper. And I tend to use a roll of tracing paper, paper that's uh, 36 inches long. Just keep talking. Um, um, pencil, sharpener, eraser, ruler. And uh, there's different kinds of rulers that you can use. Uh, I use the scale ruler with um, different scales. Um, and then <clears throat> a rolling ruler helps you 
find um, parallels. Um, for example, if you have a line, you can just drag that with a rolling ruler and make another line over here. So it's a lot easier <clears throat> to find, you know, squares and yeah. And then color pencils or markers if uh, you want to color code your plant. So I was cruising through um, Google Earth and I found this house and I'm like, oh, this is a great example to, you know, to use. So it's pretty much didn't have anything, just a gravel. So I was able to take measurements through Google Earth. And yeah, so this is what I will be using for this example. Um, so I'm going to pretend this is my house. Um, the first thing I notice when it rains is, is how the water washes down the roof. And so I'm going to be adding a gutter here and then maybe direct the water flow to drain down here. So that's gonna be a nice spot for you know a swell or like a basin to capture that rainwater and soak it into the ground. So I'm gonna take that note. So now let's jump into step one. So you wanna create a base plan. So start by taking measurements of your garden and then use the a quarter inch scale to draw a clean version of, um, of a scale drawing. So uh, what, I, what I mean by a quarter inch scale is that every quarter inch equals a foot on paper. So, and then you end up something like this, more clean. Um, <clears throat> in, your, in your base plan, you wanna include existing features like the house, including windows and doors, especially windows, because windows are gonna help you find those um, focal points that you can enjoy from with inside your house. Um, any other permanent structures, if you have like a tool shed or you know, a fountain that you wanna keep, you, you, you should draw, draw those in, on the base plan and any existing um, pathways and driveways. It doesn't have to be perfect, but close enough so you can get the sense of your space. Always include the narrow arrow, I mean the north arrow <laughs> for orientation. Um, this helps you um, visualize the patterns of the sun while you're designing. Any questions? That's good, okay, I'm gonna drink some water. <laughs> So step two, uh, you wanna create a bubble diagram. And these are things that you want in your garden, like a seating area, um, uh, rain gardens and swells, mounds, and also take notes on your location, site conditions, sun patterns, and note summer versus winter. So in the summer, the sun usually is higher up in the sky and in the winter is lower in the horizon. Um, also take note of microclimates, like is, are there any wet areas or does flooding happens when it rains? And bubble diagrams tend to look like this, pretty messy. Um, but it gives you um, an idea of the areas you want and what you wanna create. So what, how I do it, I just uh, place a clean sheet of tracing paper over the scale plan, and then I just draw bubbles. And then I will go through um, each bubble and explain my thought process so you can have a better idea of how I do things. <laughs> So yeah, so for this, so step two, uh, creating a bubble diagram. Um, so things I want uh, here, it's a privacy hedge here um, that's gonna give me privacy from my neighbor. And maybe I wanna put a nice tree here for um, to give me some shade from the harsh afternoon sun. And I wanna put a sitting area here so to enjoy the garden. Um, then I, like I said, I want a meadow, so I want that to take most of the space. So maybe uh, put it here and I want it to go over the pathway too. So when I come home, I can feel like I'm walking through the meadow. Um, and, maybe, and the swell, it's going to be here with the, you know, the water drains from the gutter there. Um, yeah, so, and then <clears throat> I like to, use mounds in my designs just because um, it makes the landscape more interesting. And also it's a way of redirecting the water into areas you want it. So for example, here, I'm going to use the uh, mounds to direct the water into the meadow and also into the swell there. Um, I know that this area here, it's uh, mostly shady. So I'm gonna take note on that. And I do like aromatic shrubs, so I'm gonna, base my plant palette with that um, 
yeah, I want to include a bunch of nice smelling plants. All right, so now let's go to step three. Uh, come up with a theme. So you want to think about what style of garden do you want, um, whether it's a modern garden, a cottage garden, or even, or even if you just want to create habitat and keep it all like natural looking. Uh, you want to try to tell a story with your garden. Choose like key plants and features and then give your garden design a title. So, and this will help you um, think about how you're going to tie all these areas together. So, for example, in this modern design I created during one of my classes, all, all designed with California native plants, this house had some interesting features um, that I liked and I wanted to take and re replicate through the landscape. For example, like this weird angle here. I um, mean, this was a really modern <laughs> looking house and it's pretty cool. But yeah, anyways, this, uh, <laughs> this angle here, um, I took it and I flipped it and then it helped me find this angle here. So that's how I kind of made the, connected the house with the landscape. Another thing that I noticed was the shape of the pool, which it was pretty interesting how it was so weird. So I took that and replicate that throughout the landscape and that kind of like brought it all together. Um, the driveway was pretty boring just to have this long, um, you know, narrow driveway with the same materials. So I added some different materials to kind of go with the part of the landscape there. So, you know, it made it more interesting. <laughs> Um, so because your because plants are already beautiful, you kind of want to design your garden that to look beautiful without plant, plants. And those two combine, you know, it's way better. <laughs> Think about that. Um, in this um, example, I kind of wanted to make it tell the story of like a spaceship landing in a different planet. So I kept that plant palette really simple. And I called it Millennium Sunset because I used three of the uh, Fremontodendron, California Sunset. So it kind of helped me with the title. All right. So now let's go back to step three. So come up with a theme. So for my example here, um, I'm going to create habitat and keep it natural. I want to feel like I'm in, at the edge of an oak woodland. Um, and some key plants, it's going to be obviously an oak tree and I want an open meadow with native bunch grasses. And of course, aromatic shrubs, plants. Maybe I'll title this at the edge of the oak woodland. And that will also help, help me, um, remind me that what, what my purpose is in this design. <clears throat> so step four, um, you want to start developing your plant palette. Uh, try to make a long list of plants that you want in your garden and eventually you're going to start cutting it out as you develop your design. Um, so your plant palette can be based on colors, um, textures, maybe favorite plants that you like or, or plant communities like desert, grassland, chaparral, coastal sage scrub, or woodland, forest, etc. So that's uh, you, if you want to copy nature with a, a plant community palette. And some examples are um, coastal shed scrap, um, oak woodland, um, chaparral. These are the ones that we get here locally. Um, yeah, so that's an example. And then oak woodland. And I really like oak woodland, so I'm going to try to use some of these plants in my design, especially that acianotes, uh, chaparral whitehorn. I, I really like the, the bark and the color of the flower. It's pretty nice. So and it's really local, so I'm gonna use it in my landscape. So step five, um, you wanna start adding your subscapes and features, and these include pathways, type of mulch, mounds, boulders, swells, um, basins, and other features like seating areas and water features. And now I'm, I'm gonna go um, go over some of these points a little bit more. So the pathways can be made of DG, wood, stone, mulch, concrete, pavers, or even a combination of any of these. Um, if you wanna have ideas, just type pathway ideas on Google or Pinterest and you'll see a bunch of different ideas and maybe you will get overwhelmed, <laughs> you can choose. <laughs> um, for this example, I like that I saw this nice picture of a 
wooden pathway. I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll use that. So I'm gonna stick with wood and DG for the other trail. Okay. Um, uh, pathways are can be um, drawn freehand, or you can use shapes to find um, your pathways. Like in this example, I only use circles to find the shape of the planters and also the shape of my pathways, and everything came pretty pretty well together. So yeah, you can be creative. Um, pathways are functional, they are aesthetic pleasing and also are part of telling your story. So when you're choosing your mulch, there are two types. Uh, we have organic um, mulches, which include wood chips, garden debris, shredded bark, um, I mean shredded leaves, and, um, and inorganic, which are like decomposed granite, uh, pebbles and rocks and boulders. Um, when you're choosing your materials, you want to choose the right ones, um, the ones that correspond to your theme or your story that you're trying to tell. So for example, if I'm doing an oak woodland, I'm not going to use uh, DG for mulch because that's going to you know, be off. Um, but if I'm making a desert landscape, I can use DG or pebbles that will make it more look like a desert. <laughs> All right. Mounds make um, the landscape more interesting. They also are functional. They provide a good planting spots for um, plants that like to stay dry, like cyanotes or manzanitas, and also give you like some crevices to put um, dahlias. Rock and boulders anchor the landscape and provide dimension, oops, <laughs> dimension and texture to the design. They also give the sense of time it makes it seem like the landscape was there before the house was built. Rain gardens and swells um, conserve water, they reduce urban runoff, um, they increase rainwater infiltration and landscape rehydration, they reduce energy use and reduce need for irrigation with portable water. They help reduce erosion and have a function too. Um, these pictures, um, Okay, this, this garden is um, Kristen Nelson's garden. Um, she made this swell. She's a member of the San Luis Obispo chapter and the Red Plant Pro Program Manager at CMPS. Um, this well is fully functional. It's two feet deep and it was filled with river rock. Um, it varies in depth, um, two to four feet wide, um, but the drainage from half of her property is funnel and capturing this small swell. And even with this, amount of rain that we received this year, it works perfect. I really like how she repurposed those um, bricks to make that little curve there. So when you're building rain gardens and swells, you wanna think like a watershed, you wanna slow spread and let the water sink into the landscape. All right, so now let's go back to our drawing and step five. So for this design, I want to use DG, a DG trail that goes all the way through my garden. And this way I can enjoy you know, the garden. But I also want to do it without bender board. Um, I want a natural transition between the DG and the mulch. This way, you know, it goes with my story of natural habitat. Uh, I want to replace the concrete path. It's too straight for my liking, so I'm going to replace demolish that and replace it with a nice curved um, wooden pathway here that can welcome me to my house. Um, and maybe I want to, well, I want to repeat the same materials throughout the landscape to bring everything together. So maybe building a little bridge that goes over the swell there and maybe a small deck over here that um, that's next to this entrance to the patio on the side. <laughs> All right. So, and then I want to build some mounds here and here and repurpose that um, concrete from the old pathway to hold together the steepest side of the mounds, like here, here, and there. So the type of mulch I'm going to use is organic wood chips and leaf debris from the trees eventually when it grows. And the mounds, I'm um, gonna repurpose those um, concrete from the one pathway there. And then I want to um, put some boulders and rocks 
all scattered around the landscape to make it more look more, make it look more natural. All right, and then that's the location of my soil. Um, yeah, so that's more. Oh, and my sitting area right there, so I can enjoy the the shade of the tree. So step six, you want to start adding your foundation plants. And these are trees, large shrubs, and medium shrubs. <clears throat> these evergreen shrubs um, and trees provide a structural backbone to your garden and give interest year round. Um, so you want to also identify focal points, um, locations. Uh, these are viewpoints from areas you and your guests um, frequent. Uh, you want to place an interesting shrub or a water feature in that view. This creates a point of interest to rest your eye at that point. All right, so now we're, I'm going to go over some of these um, trees and large shrubs and medium sized medium -sized shrubs that I could use in this design. So some native trees that are suitable for riverside include the Englandman oak. Why did this keep happening? <laughs> um, Sycam uh, California sycamore and the coastal uh, coast live oak. Um, some, you can also use some other native trees like the Sanana, uh, Santa Cruz ironwood. Um, we have one here in the Land Use Learning Center, and yeah, they look pretty good. Evergreen tree uh, has beautiful red bark. So I, for my design, I think I'm going to stick with the incremental because it has really pretty leaves, and I like the bark, too, and how they grow. All right, so large shops are those that get 10 to 30 feet um, high and wide. Uh, large shrubs um, can be used for local uh, focal points, privacy hedges, and formal hedges. Some can also uh, grow into small trees, like this um, toyan here. Uh, the toyan comes in two different types, uh, one with red berries and another one with yellow berries. And I think uh, locally here, I've seen some yellow berry toyans around here. So yeah, it's interesting <laughs> to come across it out in nature. Um, other late, uh, large native shrubs include the big berry manzanita um, and the sugar bush. And you can see here how combined they look pretty cool. This is a toyan here, this is a manzanita, and then you have the sugar bush. Another cool shrub um, is the holly leaf cherry. And this can be a small tree. Um, it provides um, food for birds during the summer. Um, and the flowers attracts a lot of uh, bees. Um, it can be a tree, a large shrub, or even uh, trained to be a formal hedge. Other, one, other ones include the Laurel sumac and lemon and berry. And these are, this can get pretty big. And of course we have our cyanotes. And these guys come in all kinds of colors shapes, um, there's ground covers, medium shrubs, and also some that can be trained to small trees. Some of the medium sized shrubs are those that get four to six feet uh, tall and wide. Um, it includes sages, sagebrush, woolly blue curls, um, buckwheat, beryl bush, gooseberries, and bush lupins. Those are just some examples, but there's all kinds. Oh, a lot more. <laughs> All right. So now that we went through a little bit of the plants, um, step six at the foundation plants. Um, so I always start with the trees. So that's the first thing I draw. And then um, for this design, maybe I want to use the toyan here and here. Um, yeah, so two toyans there to give me that privacy I want, but also I want to repeat it. Um, in the other corner right here. So to tie those two areas together and see it's starting to look more balanced. Because of the having two toyans here, uh, maybe it's gonna get too solid and it's gonna be look the same. So maybe I wanna put a mountain mahogany in between them and that will give me uh, a little bit of contrast between the big leaf of the toyan and also the small leaf of the uh, mountain mahogany and they look pretty cool together too. And it also gives me that sense of you know the oak woodland. I mean, yeah, then you might not see them there, but you know it gives that feel of yeah. 
Um, and maybe over here, I want to add that um, holy leaf cherry, and that will provide that food in the summer for the birds. The toyans um, have berries in the winter, and then you have, you know, the olive cherry in the summer providing food for birds. All right. Uh, for a focal point, maybe I want to use that um, cianotes, the one with the white bark. And I'm going to put one here next to the um, entrance to the side uh, patio. And that's kind of hidden, so that's good. I can use another one somewhere where it's more visible. So I'm going to put one right here so I can, people that walk through the street, I can enjoy it. And I can also enjoy it um, when I'm, I can view it through this large window here. Um, I'm also going to take the, the center of that window and draw imaginary line and maybe play something else here. Maybe a low growing manzanita, like Arctostaphylis sunset. That's going to be, you know, it's going to look pretty nice, I think. All right. There we go. And um, now that I've done most of the larger shrubs, I'm going to start putting my uh, medium sized shrubs. And I really like the Cleveland sage. Um, it's a plant I use for cooking as well. So I want to have three of those. Um, I like how the Cleveland sage and the sweet bush, Bebia juncea, um, it's a local, more local plant here, um, look together. So I'm going to put one in between those two and maybe add two more over here. And that will make it look more natural. What was that? Uh, who? Uh, Bebia. Yeah, sweet, sweet bush. Yellow flowers. Yeah. <laughs> it's nice. Bebia. 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 So the yellow and the purple, and they kind of like um, flower at the same time. So yeah, having those two in flower, they look pretty nice. And they also uh, contrast with their foliage. All right. So. And then as I walk down this pathway and over the little bridge. Maybe I want to put a focal point here. So I'm going to plant a uh, white sage. And I really want to let that white sage take over that space. So I'm going to make it, you know, keep it long, big, because they can get pretty, pretty big. And right in front of it, I want to put some California buckwheat. And I want those to cover that space. and. The buckwheat and the white sage, they go very well together, have good contrast too with foliage. And also when the flowers go turn into like a rusty color, it looks pretty cool with the white and the red rusty. All right, so that pretty much concludes my foundation plants. So now step seven, you wanna start adding your details. And these are the small plants like bunch grasses and small herbaceous perennials. So before we, I go over my placement here, we're gonna go over the plants, some of the plants. So small native perennials are those that get two to four feet. Um, include, they include penstemons, monkey flowers, hummingbird sage, coyote mints, um, common yarrow, California fuchsia, and native, and native ground covers. And yeah, and there's a lot more. And this is just a small list. I really like how the royal penstemon and Penstemon centratifolius look like. <laughs> so I think I'm gonna, you know, use those two in my design and monkey flowers. All right. Um, there are also native plants for dry shade gardens, and those include monkey flowers, pitcher sage, coral bells, Carolina currant, um, hummingbird sage, and Oregon, Oregon, Oregon grape. Um, I really like the hummingbird sage. They smell pretty nice and, um, and the coral bells. So I'm going to use those two. And maybe I'll use the Carolina current too. Maybe after the tree gets big and provides that shade that they need. Because over here in Riverside, it will burn if, you know, if it's exposed too much, to too much sun. All right. So native grasses, um, they soften the landscape. They, you can also replace your land with a native meadow. Um, some examples include the deer grass, which is a bigger size um, bunch grass, um, blue grandma, purple needle grass, um, purple trion, and small flower melica. And the small flower melica, it's a good one for like shaded areas. Um, 
you can put those underneath the oak trees as well. If you really want a lawn, um, there's alternatives. Yeah, so Phyla Mariflora is that one ground cover that I used um, in that little design garden. Um, Phyla Mariflora curapia, it's a cultivar of, um, it's a cultivar developed in Japan. And the cool thing is that it's sterile, so it won't get out of control by seed. Common yarrow is another one that you can use as a lawn alternative. And then some sedges like the metal sedge and cluster field sedge. And these, um, these two, um, you can let them grow and you have a metal look or mow it too and have more of a lawn. Yeah. Okay. So it's a good idea to use uh, annuals and fast growing annuals and short leaf perennials are perfect between young and slower to establish plants. And this will fill the space quick and provide spring color, um, sp springtime burst of color. <laughs> All right, so now let's go back to the design. Um, so you want to start grouping the small plants. You want to group them. Um, you want to, so you want to group the same plant in groups of odd numbers, and this will create a sense of balance and unity in the design, and repeat that throughout the rest of the garden where whenever it's appropriate. appropriate. So for this example, I like the coral bells, so I'm gonna put a five a group of five here, and then maybe repeat it here. So, you know, it, it leads me to the pathway and yeah. And then maybe may do another one over here so that it's tying those two areas together. I like hummingbird sage. So I'm gonna do a group for here and then repeat that here. And that's also, you know, helping lead, the, lead you through the pathway and lead, lead the eye through the garden. And maybe repeat it over here too, since that area gets shady. So, you know, it's bring it even more together. <laughs> uh, the Carolina current, um, maybe I'll put three here, but um, maybe I will wait till the tree gets big enough to provide that shade that it needs. But see, having a, a plan helps you plan for the future as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and uh, so down here, let me go over here. So this is all full sun. So I wanna choose plants that can tolerate that, especially here in Riverside. So I'm gonna stick with uh, those pen Um So I'm gonna put some pen stamens in planting folios here and then repeat that here. And maybe do the royal pen stamen there. And hopefully over time, these guys will hybridize and I'll start getting some cool hybrids in the garden. Uh, for the entrance, uh, maybe I want to use a bigger bunch grasses to welcome me to my house and my guests. So having like three here, I think it will look really nice. Um, and then I want to plant the big meadow. And for my choices, I'm going to go with Stipa pulcra and Stipa lepida, a mix of those two. And this will be a nice spot for those bulbs that I want to grow. And having this type of um, bunch grasses, they're pretty easy to clean. Um, the only maintenance required is when they go dormant. Right before they start coming up again, you just rake them up and it looks pretty clean. And that's all you have to do, no mowing, none of that. All right. So what's next? Because I'm creating habitat for pollinators, maybe um, I want to include some native milkweed. So I'll place one there, one here, and one right there, like right next to the edge of the, that swell. And um, I love monkey flowers, so I'm gonna put some scatter all over the, my design here, and maybe a, a nice group up there. Um, and dahlias are good to put um, between those crevices where the rocks are, so I'll put some there. And in the swell, um, maybe I'll do some carex since they can, you know, um, tolerate that water. And yeah, that's pretty much completes my design. Um, <clears throat> it's up to you how you want to like either uh, use color to coat your plants and your placement, or you can use numbers too. And you have your list, a number, numbered, li numbered, and then you just write the number on those circles there. 
this way it's like a, a guide. All right, so now let's go through a few design tips. Yeah. Did you mention about the hybrid learning? Oh yeah, no. <laughs> Thank you for that. So I'm placing plants with similar water water needs, and this will help me um, come up with a design for my irrigation system. So you want to make sure that you're using plants that have the same you know water needs and grouping them. Yeah, and that's how you develop your system, your water irrigation system. Yeah, thank you for that. <laughs> All right, so design tips. So using reclaimed and salvaged materials are a sustainable way to add character and interest to your landscape. Um, these are uh, the, the homeowners here, they renew their, if I remember right, they re remodeled their driveway and they used all that concrete to build this um, garden wall. And then they put some um, native plants between the crevices and you look, it looks pretty cool. Also, um, large logs um, give you that sense of time, like the landscape was there for a long time. So that's, that's a good thing to include. Um, contrasting texture, color, height, and form create a year-round interest in your garden. And also you want to show off some unique branching structures and bark textures like manzanitas. And yeah, that's pretty much concludes my presentation. So some resources, um, cascape.org um, helps you find the plants in your area and tells you a lot more about you know, individual plants. And then bloomcalifornia.org um, has really good resources. Um, they have garden inspiration and you can find um, nurseries uh, that, that can carry your plants. Um, and they also have these examples of um, designs that you can take and replicate in your yard. So yeah, so with that, thank you for being here. <laughs> Great. Thanks very much, Ernesto. I've got inspiration for our area. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I forgot to mention, to tell them that we were part of the class. Our, our oh, yeah. Say it. You can't hear me. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot to mention that. <laughs> okay. um, so, anybody has any questions? I can try to. Uh, can we get a copy of that PowerPoint presentation that you did? Um, yeah, um, how can we do that? <laughs> the program, I don't know if they can hear me, so you might have to record it. Oh, they'll hear you. It's recorded. You um, wanna... The program is really recorded. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
you're ready. Oh. Can you hear me? Oh. Uh, yeah. Um, some of them, yeah, but we, um, we're hoping to increase our um, species here. So yeah, hopefully we'll have a lot of these available soon. Sounds like we may have be able to include them in our plant sale. Yeah, so a lot, yeah, so a lot of these plants you you can find them in a plant sale in the CMPS plant sale. Is that only online or can we come over? Yeah. Yeah, our, the the California native plant sale is our chapter has plant sales in the fall. And yeah. then we'll be advertised. If you sign up for a mailchimp list, you'll definitely get um, a notice about our plant sale. And then um just to, to mention, at least to the people in this room, um, tomorrow is the public plant sale that the UC, our botanic garden is having. It's an online plant sale. So if you go on to, oh, let's see. If you go, yeah, if you go to um, HTTPS, I'm going to write it on the board for people. Um, so you can ask, and they have a lot of native plants. There. Sorry that I that the people that you can tell the people of Zoom that I'm doing this. <laughs> Wait, what was it? Sorry. Hey, Katie, you had a question or? Hello? Um, can you hear me? I have some questions from the folks that are on Zoom. Uh huh. So the first question is from Wendy Lasovsky, and she asks, How is clover to use as a lawn replacement? I don't know. I don't use that. <laughs> but, uh, native clover or native? <laughs> I haven't seen. I think native learner seed has native clover. Yeah. Learner. 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 Seed. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> you wanna? So, so that was um, orchid. That was larner. Seed. Yes, larner seed. There you go. In Riverside. Um. Larner seed is in Northern California. Oh. Um, Judith Larner Lowry wrote um, The Landscaping Ideas of Jays, a book everyone should have, and, um, and Wild uh, Gardening with a Wild Heart. Okay, so it's Larner, L-A-R-N-E-R -E seeds. You could look it up online for native clovers. Okay, there's a question from Denise Mitchell. She said she missed the species in the swale. Oh, uh, Carex bergasilis. Um, yeah, um, slender Madden. field sedge. Slender field sedge. You might want to spell it for it. I'm just going to type it in the chat. For oh, OK. Oh, there you so go. tell them. Okay. Uh, yeah, um, Orchid is going to put it on, on, the, on the chat. Was it just only that species? Only that species? That's how he mentioned I think that's it, yeah. 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 Um, okay, so an, a comment from an anonymous. Um, this was such a good presentation. I've been to a few of these, and this was so informative. Ernesto is such an engaging presenter. Thank you very much. <laughs> I hope I get better with that. <laughs> um, then another question from Krista Moreno. Do you have to switch out old sprinklers with drip systems? Um, yeah, that's if I mean, if you're using like uh, the sprinklers from Milan, yeah, you probably want to switch it to like a drip system. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then Robert Schaff has a question. Do you recommend specific apps or programs for drawing the outlines of the landscape plan? Um, see, I don't really use any like um, computer or apps. I, I don't. I, I, don't like it. It's a drop from any drop program. But yeah, I guess any you can use any drop program. Yeah. Yeah, Microsoft Draw or LibreOffice Draw. Yeah, and how will you do it with uh, the scale? Does it have some tool like that? A lot of them do. Okay. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I prefer hand drawn. I don't know. It grounds me better and it's a lot nicer. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. just in case everybody could hear, um, Orchid mentioned that. While the preferred method is hand drawn, looks more fun. Um, there's a Microsoft Draw or any Draw program you could potentially use that has um, measuring options. Um, also, Corel Draw has scale, so that's the you know 
between Corel Draw and AutoCAD is a big leap. So most people could <laughs> work out the scale at Corel. Okay. Yeah, to me. Yeah, tell them we have a question from the audience. Okay. Yeah, I have so a question. Another... Okay. Wait, wait. Go ahead. Okay. okay, go ahead. The timing of your plantings. When would you start? Uh, so right now it's a good time. To, oh, so they're asking about the timing of planting. Uh, right now it's a good uh, time to design your garden and maybe plant in the fall. It's the best time. Yeah. So, you know, the plants get all the rain. Uh-huh. So Katie. I have another question for you from Keith Lyons. Seeds and bulbs, um, what are the types to plant this time of year? Oh, this time of year, no. <laughs> you have to wait till the fall. Yeah. Um, you can find um, seed or bulbs in, um, on your CMPS plant sales. They usually carry them. So, so everyone could hear, um, I guess you could all hear. I'll put that in the chat too. Okay, and Ernesto, the uh, resources that you mentioned, um, I know Orchid mentioned the Chino Valley Basin Water Conservation District, which um, she put in the chat, and I'll put the link for Cal Flora, and we can add those to our website when we post the recording. We'll add some links to some of the resources that were mentioned. Cool. Yes. How do you deal with weeds, both initially and long term? <laughs> so maybe before you start, you want to really reduce the seed bank of weeds. Um, solarization is a method. Um, some people do sheet mulching, where you put um, cardboard and then mulch on top. And yeah, that's where I, I hand pull everything. <laughs> so yeah, you, I spend a lot of time pulling weeds. Because <laughs> I like to also keep uh, the, the soil bare for native bees and stuff. So yeah. Island about poaching and white sage. So I just want to make sure everyone here knows don't go out and like the, the white sage. Uh, go with the yeah. And that's why it's good to add one in your garden. <laughs> um, yes. I just wanted to mention that um, we are going to try to get a uh, showing of saving the world. Um, which is a great film, um, you know, produced um, by Rose Ramirez and jointly, and, and uh, I'm sorry, I forgot the other woman's name in the California Native Plant Society. It's been shown just about everywhere, <laughs> but not in Riverside. So I'll be working with Rose to try to give a showing somewhere here in the other side. We can get it at the Coleman Center or something like that. Um, and that talks about the problems of poaching the white sage um, that have been happening here in California. This, you know, white sage has a very restricted distribution and it's been really detrimental to white sage population. Harvesting white sage and pulling up a plant for the you know, industry for people to sell it. Is, friends I don't do. let friends buy white sage or burn it. Yeah, so if you want white sage, you, know, you grow it, you know, from reputable sources that are supplying the seeds and, and plants for food in the garden. So, so yeah. just a good message. Thank you. All right. Um, Ernesto? Yeah. Um, I just had one comment, if you don't mind. It was a great program. I wanted to mention when you talked about adding rocks, um, rocks are an incredible way to increase the wildlife value of your garden, mm -hmm. um, especially piles of rocks that become cover for lizards and small mammals. If you like snakes, that's a great place for snakes who are <laughs> <laughs> yeah. to eat all the critters that you don't want. Um, so, so besides, um, they definitely add visual interest, but they also are a huge benefit in terms of wildlife value. Yeah, yes. Okay, so the timing is perfect. Yeah. You, oh, there's another question. Nice question. For yeah. critters you don't want, what about gophers? Is there a, a natural native way, aside from pounding on the dirt, because for the right reason they don't like? What do you do for gophers? 
Is it trap? <laughs> yeah, I mean, some people like to keep uh, have them in their yard because you know it's part of nature. But um, but yeah, if you have a big problem, I mean, you have to trap them. Yeah, or snakes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that looks. Yeah, a dog or okay. Yeah, just don't use poison. Yeah. Yeah, just yeah, don't use poison. No poisons yeah. in your garden. It's really detrimental to our local mm -hmm. wildlife. I'm up in the mountains, Crestline, Rolly Arrowhead, mm -hmm. and we have lots and lots of boulders. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, they, they're everywhere. We send them down. Thank <laughs> 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 you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, they can be very damaging. That could be trapped. Yeah. Yeah. So the the <laughs> hack, the hack is a very really good trap. <laughs> yeah. I didn't know that there is. They don't like the daffodil bulbs. So we have lots of that, but other kind of bulbs forget it. Bulbs. Oh yeah. And and I plant everything in both the pages. I didn't know if there was a specific plant that they just do not like the the root aroma from. You want to answer that question? <laughs> soap plant. Soap plant. Soap plant is toxic. Um, oh really? It, it was used as a food by Native American chefs, but it was roasted first. Yeah, it's it's harder to get. Sometimes we'll have it at our sale. Yeah, I have yeah, that in my yard. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you have you can put those in your meadow. That's a good thing yeah. for the meadow. Uh -huh. Yeah, if you're doing the, the meadow or around. Um, so plant. Yeah, I mean, yeah, there aren't too many native plants, and they. Yeah. I can think well, of them. I don't have trouble with gophers and sages. Have you ever had problems with gophers and sages? I think that I have. Yeah, I, I have so many gophers. I, mean, I have a large property, and uh, I never put my sages in baskets when I plant them. Uh, but yeah, planting using like chicken wire baskets to start. You don't want to use hardware cloth because that's going to spray on your roots eventually. Um, but you can use chicken wire, and um, there are all kinds of ways. Should be gopher wire. Gopher wire or gopher wire. Yeah, that's better. Gopher wire. Yeah. Ernesto, I have one more uh, question yeah. from online. The question is, can you recommend a place to purchase medium and large boulders? Oh, I can't think of one of them. White water. White water? You have, yeah, there's a local rock yard. There is one. A lo yeah, so local rock yard. Southwest. Southwest. It's just online. Yeah, <laughs> it's wherever I am, Google the local, you know, which yard rock yard. There's a rock yard in the Simmerscale Valley. There's yeah. white water. There, you know, there's um, one in San Bernardino. I can't remember the name. The Polvida, I think. Polvida, yeah. So mm -hmm. why do you why do you why do we not just say go to one because moving rocks is very expensive. Yeah, we want your local one. Yeah, so local. So stay local. <laughs> yeah, as much as possible. Yeah. Um, so are we done? So I'm gonna take some care. Thank you so yeah. much, Ernesto.